she, she used the word enlightening. Now the pressure's on. <laughs> um, we're continuing today uh, talking about Joseph. And I actually was thinking about this. Um, if I were to summarize it, in Sunday school today, we were in Matthew 23, and it is Jesus confronting the Pharisees about their hypocrisy. And I was just thinking about, you know, if, if you were to just distill it down to its essence, it's that character matters. And that's one of the things that we'll find illustrated today as we really dive into Joseph's story. But we're just going to pick up in uh, chapter 39. Uh, just the first verse says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. <clears throat> Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So you might be able to guess a little bit about why I chose those Proverbs for our call to worship. We're at this point in Joseph's story where there's this contrast between the behavior of the wicked and the behavior of the trustworthy. We have his behavior and we have the behavior of Potiphar's wife. So you know, Joseph's been sold twice at this point. And, um, you know, even though God, Joseph's dreams were God's intention, they were still what led him to this point. So, you know, we realize that um, it does matter how you share God's revelation. That was probably one of Joseph's problems. It doesn't matter whether it's dreams or, or from some other source. It matters how you receive God's revolution, revelation, whether it's presented well or not. You know, each person has their own responsibility, the one presenting and the one receiving. Um, so, God can speak even through somebody who's unrighteous. He can speak through somebody who's bitter. He can speak through wicked persons. He can speak through an enemy. And if he's speaking to us, it's our responsibility then to consider what nugget of truth might be in all of that. And then it's also our responsibility to consider the weight of that truth because somebody who's unrighteous, somebody who's an enemy, will put far too much weight on any shortcoming you might have. And that's what we see happen with Joseph's brothers. They saw something in him they didn't like. They put far too much weight on it. They betrayed him. They treated him badly. And I think we see that played out then in the rest of this story too with other people. So he's stripped of his robe. That's this outward sign of his favor with his father Jacob. He's sold into slavery in Potiphar's house. And here's where we start to see Joseph as a man. Not, not just a boy, not just a 17-year-old boy, but somebody who shows integrity. We can look at his integrity, we can look at his behavior, we can look at even his problem solving. And this is where he starts to become an example for us. So we pick up the story, Genesis 39, verse 2, and we find out that the Lord was with Joseph. It says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw the Lord <clears throat> was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. So despite all of it, despite being sold into slavery, despite being sold twice, not just once, but sold twice, all the betrayal, it says the Lord was with Joseph. And you'll notice up there that the Lord is, well, actually it's not in that text, but in the text it is all capitals in most of our Bibles. It means it's the covenant name. It's even before that covenant name was given to Moses on the mountain. But Moses, in penning this down, said, this is the one, this covenant God. He's working here and now. So this is a, a covenant game. There are covenant goals at work here. That's what's happening. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. Uh, not that Joseph followed after God, but that God was with Joseph. And I actually went back and read Joseph's story just to check. Because we know that there are other people in the Bible, other people in Scripture who chased after God. But we haven't heard that about Joseph yet. It just says that the Lord was with Joseph. He was propelling events forward for Joseph. And this Egyptian recognizes God's hand on Joseph. And isn't that an amazing thing? That somebody who is so far from God, the, the Egyptians, they elevated themselves to deity, uh, but they see that, the, that God is with Joseph and that he's blessed in all of his efforts. So what does he do? He entrusts his entire household over to Joseph. And when you read that, it's not that he just said, oh, go do the handiwork around the house or anything like that. Everything of substance was handed over to Joseph. So that probably meant the finances, that meant the maintenance of the home. Uh, he probably had lands and properties uh, because he was high up in the hierarchy uh, of, of the Egyptians. And all of it was entrusted to Joseph's hands. So if we want to pick out one behavior, and that's one of the things we'll pick out today for Joseph, he worked, and he worked in good faith, no matter where he was at. 
And this is one of the things that we'll pick up that's admirable about Joseph. And if we want to get to a New Testament connection on this, you can think about the part where Paul says, Servants, obey your masters. And here's Joseph living it out thousands of years before. And we always, have, we always struggle with that because we don't like the idea of servitude. Uh, you know, the Western culture, we struggle with the, with the history and legacy of things like that. But servitude was a part of the ancient Near East. It was something that existed, so it was reported by God, it was talked about by God, but not necessarily approved by God. And then God gave instruction on how to handle it. Later on when we get to the laws, the Old Testament connection would be that uh, the laws actually reduced the burden of servitude, and it also reduced Israel's participation in the practice uh, of servitude, of slavery, uh, and they kept it internal, and they, gave it, they kept it from being permanent. So God has always addressed issues that are going on in the culture and put boundaries on them and told us how to deal with them. And here's Joseph living it out. Servants, obey your masters. And so he worked hard. He worked in good faith wherever he was at. Our passage goes on and says, From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that was owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. <clears throat> with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. So not only was God with Joseph, and not only did God bless Joseph in whatever he put his hand to, God blessed the household of this Egyptian by extension. He said, if you're going to serve here, then I'm going to bless this as well. And I think if we were to learn something from that, it's that closeness to God overflows in blessing to others, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And that's something that we should remember. If we're truly close to God, there should be some overflow in our life, and it should impact people around us. Again, a New Testament connection would be to say that we should be salt and light in the world. When you think about that idea, if you're close to God, if you're a disciple, if you are part of God's church, if you're salt and light, God's presence and behavior, and godly presence and behavior works a blessing for those around. It's also a testimony to the people around, and it's also a preservative for the culture around. So that's what's happening in Potiphar's household. There's a godly man. He's working and it has become a blessing. It's become a testimony to his God. And it is preserving in a way, or even blessing in a way, that it would not have otherwise. And we find out that Potiphar was not only blessed, he was doubly blessed. So not only were now the, the efforts of his household fruitful in a way they had never been before, he didn't even have to concern himself with anything. He could go do what it meant to be the, <clears throat> what they call him, the master of the guard. He, whether it's recruiting or training or, or you know, what, whatever it was that they did. He could go do those things and then he could come back to his home and everything had been taken care of. So he was doubly blessed by Joseph's presence. And we also find that there's this sort of poetic repetition. That's something to look for in Old Testament scripture when you see ideas repeated. It's, it's a poetic way of saying something. It's a way of storytelling to point things out. I always thought of Joseph as close to God, but the Lord was with him. And we found that repeated. God was with him, God blessed his efforts, and then he was recognized and he was given responsibility. So we'll see that again. So the next point that we come to is the dilemma. All right? And my notes have this a, a, a different way. It's uh, the dilemma of a, a handsome man. <laughs> we can relate, right, fellas? <laughs> I, I knew that would get a laugh. <laughs> I was in a certain type of mood when I wrote this. <laughs> So, okay, to the scripture. It says, Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in his house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. So my first thought was, Oh, what a little hussy. <laughs> not, not to be old school, right? But that maybe that's a, a phrase we need to bring back. It, it actually says something. Um, but what we're really looking at then is the behaviors that come out of this. First off, Joseph's response. And I, I characterized it three ways. It was resistance, refusal, and integrity. And we can talk about each of them. First off, to resist, right? What we find here is that he has consistent ongoing behaviors and actions where he resists 
this temptation or, or this, this call to basically do something that was wicked. So that's resistance. But then there was outright refusal. There's a direct no involved. And then he maintains his integrity throughout. So even though all of this is going on, he continues to do the right thing, even in difficulty. And, and what he does then is um, he appeals to loyalty. He talks about, my master Potiphar has placed me in charge. And when he speaks of his loyalty, it should be then calling out to her sense of loyalty towards Potiphar. But it doesn't. All of these things have broader applications. They have applications to other temptations. We can use the same things when we're faced with problems in our lives. We can resist. We can refuse. We can always look to our integrity. It goes on and, say, and <clears throat> gives Joseph's response a little bit further. It says, No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. So, not only did he talk about his loyalty, he spoke about his responsibility. And he took it seriously. He acted it out day after day. And so part of his behavior then was he stated the case of loyalty. He stated the case of responsibility. And then he outlined the implications of it. He said, it would be a sin against Potiphar because he's placed this trust in me. And then he said further, it would be a sin against God. So he has this consistency. He resists, he refuses, he maintains his integrity. And I think we should do all those same things and we should also know why when we do it. Because that way we can state our case. If ever we're faced with difficulty where somebody is asking us to do something we shouldn't. The New Testament connection to this, I think, um, is a particularly good one. Jesus in the wilderness. What did he do? Well, he resisted for 40 days. That 40 days, you can characterize it a number of ways, but in some ways he was just resisting the temptation to go on as he would. He marked a transition point to go forward with that plan that would take him to the cross. And then what happened was he refused three times. Satan came to him with a very direct offer, and he said no each and every time. So he maintained his integrity throughout, and then he stated his case by reciting Scripture back to Satan. That's exactly how we should handle any temptation that's placed before us. Any uh, anytime somebody asks us to engage in something wicked, something that we know is wrong. Well, Joseph's circumstances is a little different than ours, right? And so we come to a point where he needs a witness. So picking up in verse 11, it says, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So there's a number of things that I see here. He went into the house, and he was attending his duties still, but he had probably been avoiding being alone with her. That's part of the resist. But it happened by chance because he was doing his duties. He was still acting with integrity towards his master Potiphar in the midst of all this difficulty. And let's talk about what he was doing too. There were some general boundaries. You know, He tried to avoid being around her. <clears throat> And we know that in some things you can only trust what trust is earned. So here she is, and, and she comes at him directly again. And what's his response? It's to flee. So two behaviors here. Avoid the temptation. Avoid the person who's trying to lead you uh, astray. And then flee in those times where uh, the, the offer is so direct and the, the problem is so in your face that there's no other option. So I think then I want to get at a little bit about what she did. We have the ways of righteousness, I would say, kind of in Joseph's behavior. But we have some of the ways of the wicked um, demonstrated here with Potiphar's wife. It says, When she saw that he had left his cloak in, his, <clears throat> in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought <clears throat> to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Wow. <laughs> so not only had she done wrong, and not only did he leave, and he'd never, there's no indication here even that he had tried to get her in trouble, but she now creates this lie surrounding it. So what has she done at this point? One thing I would say, and this is true of, of many people who try and lead others astray, she pushed the boundaries. There was this direct thing that she did early on. 
She took notice of him, but she continued to push the boundaries. I'm sure she continued to make him uncomfortable every time he was around her. What else did she do? Well, she ignored reason. Joseph presented her with reason. That's what most of us should do, too. When we're faced with somebody who's gone astray, so we should confront them with reason. But the wicked are often resistant to reason. There's, there's several reasons. There's reasons for that. <laughs> there's reasons they're resistant to reason. They're simply uninterested. They don't care. They're interested in what they want at that time, and they're about getting it whatever way they, whatever way they can. So they can't even relate to the values. Joseph reasoned according to values, according to loyalty, according to duty, according to all those things, but she couldn't relate. And then what does she do? Another ploy of the wicked, it's to lie. And lie especially when caught. And of course, like most lies, there's a nugget of truth in it. He was here. He did leave his cloak. What a wonderful piece of truth that can be used for this lie. So then she mischaracterizes the evidence. So these are some of the ways of the wicked. And if you ever doubt, you can always look back at Scripture and you can recognize nothing has ever changed. People of integrity do the same things that Joseph does. People who are wicked and bent on it do the same things that Potiphar's wife did. It says she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And then she told him this story. The Hebrew slave you brought you brought us, came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. So what did she do? She placed temptation. She, she placed something out of bounds before him. But then she holds on to something that she can use against him. That, that's another thing that we see in wicked people. They'll hold on to things that they can use against you. What are we told to do? We're told to forgive. We're essentially told to forget wrongs done to us, right? But the wicked go exactly the opposite direction. What else is she intent on? She's intent on keeping up a facade. Whether it's the facade of the good wife, I can't imagine that's the case. I, I, I would think the servants um, that, that were there most of the time but weren't there that day probably had some idea. But they can't stand someone who knows and resists. I was trying to think about uh, a good illustration of this, and there's, uh, we, we've all seen the mafia movies, right? The mob movies. And you've got the, the shop owner who's, you, you know, who's trying to do the right thing, and they offer him that bribe. It's that offer they can't resist, you know? You're going to participate in this with me, or we're going to destroy you. And that's what she does. She's intent on keeping up the facade, but when she can't, she can't stand someone who knows and then resists. And then she attributes her sin to others. I've watched, uh, I've mentioned this before, Ginger and I kind of binge watched a lot of Survivor. And you know, you got kind of heroes and villains as a theme in that. But you catch people at certain times in it where they start talking to the others. And you realize that they're attributing to that person who's probably been a pretty good guy this, the things that they do themselves. They're very hypocritical about it. Well, here she is, and she says, He's come to make sport of us. But what was she doing? She was making sport of Joseph. So she attributed to him what she herself was doing. She insisted on the double standard, that you pay attention to what she falsely attributed to Joseph, but that you ignore it with her. Matter of fact, pretend it never happened. So finally, what happens then? We have this illustration of somebody who's acting with integrity, somebody who's acting wickedly every step of the way, and the one with integrity ends up in prison. It says, when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So we see that Potiphar was very quick to judge. Have you ever noticed the world's kind of quick to judge? That, that I think, more than anything, whether it's social media, whatever it is, that's one of the turns that we've probably seen over the last, really, decade and a half. But what happened was he believed the first testimony. He believed the testimony that was brought to him first. And malevolent people are often very quick to slander. Again, the ways of the wicked. And, and you get to this point in the story, and you can't help but think to yourself, it's, it's unfair, right? I mean, if you have any sense of righteousness in you, you're thinking, this is unfair. But you have to remember, this is God's servant. 
and God's servants often are not treated with fairness. The fact is, God's ser servants are the ones who pursue justice and fairness, right? But we shouldn't expect justice and fairness from a fallen world. That's the story of Genesis 3. So, uh, excuse me, unfairness, injustice, wickedness have been part of the story of this world ever since that time. Said another way, though, we should be the ones who bring justice and fairness into the world. And that'll be part of Joseph's story, too. So I think one of the things that's often overlooked in this story is that there was a consequence. For Potiphar, he lost the blessings that came from Joseph's presence the minute he jumped to conclusions. He lost the benefit of the salt and light that Joseph brought into his household the minute he jumped to conclusions and chose to side with a wicked woman. But the Lord blessed Joseph. He just no longer blessed Potiphar's house. So the story goes on and says, But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to any, anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So remember I said there's poetic repetition. And it's not unintentional. It is intentional in telling the story and it's also intentional in the way God does things. We should take note. It says the Lord was with him. So we've read that multiple times, and I think that is the main point. If you can take anything else away, the Lord was with him. The Lord chose Joseph first. And then Joseph eventually began to respond, as a servant of God should. But he gained favor with the warden, just as he had favor with Potiphar. And we noticed that, um, that he always had favor with whatever authority was before him, um, and, and even on a very strange path. Because if we look at the authorities that he had favor with, it was Jacob, and then Potiphar, and then a warden. So it was Jacob, his father, and then it was Potiphar, his master, and then it was a warden where he was prisoner. So this seems like a decline in status. But in each event, he was, entrust he was entrusted with the charge of the other prisoners, just as he had been entrusted with the servants in Potiphar's house. And then the warden had no worries for anything that happened there, just as Potiphar had no worries about anything that happened in his house. So the Lord gave him success in whatever he did. That was the last line there. It says, Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So it's this positive statement, even for someone who is in prison. And I think that points out to us that success looks different in the service of God. Success for Paul didn't look like what we would consider success. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. We can just enumerate so many things that happened to Paul. Success for Jesus looked like a cross. And success looks different when the Lord is with you as well. In all the bad circumstances, success really is simply that, that the Lord is with you. It doesn't matter the circumstances. If you maintain your integrity and your walk with God, that is success. And that carries over, not just in this life, but it carries over into the next life. We can all take this from Joseph's walk with God. And we can all do those same things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this example. We thank you that, Lord, you have always raised up men and women of God. That, Lord, you have given us these examples in Scripture. We thank you that, Lord, you value integrity over success in the world terms. That, that your, your definition of success truly has something to do with our character. So Lord, we invite you to continue that work that you've begun in each one of us. Uh, when we proclaim you as Lord, I, I pray that you will truly conform us to your will, that you will truly make us yours, that we will be a success according to your kingdom and not the kingdom of this world. Lord, we thank you once again for who you are. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that each one of us is here because of you because of what you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.